we hear in our scriptures today about faith. And it's interesting to see what we hear in that first reading, that Jesus is the leader and perfecter of our faith. Other translations literally say he is the author and perfecter of faith. Which is good news, because if we are lacking in faith, we just come to Jesus, and he will give us more. He will perfect our faith. Isn't that great? This is very good news. Jesus does not ask us to have something that he won't help us to get. He doesn't say, just believe, though he did say that to Jairus. But he says this to us first by showing his power at work. And we see in the gospel what happens when Jesus' power is made known, when who he is in his nature as healer and Lord is made known. Because specifically we hear that a woman with a hemorrhage, an issue of blood, has heard about Jesus. She has heard that people can approach Jesus and be healed, but she's got a problem. What's the problem? She's considered ritually impure because she has an issue of blood. So normally she's used to seeing Jesus go and touch people. In fact, Jairus, the synagogue official, says, please come lay your hands on my daughter. Because there was something about that physical touch. This woman realizes, okay, I have to somehow touch Jesus. But I'm impure ritually, right? And if I touch him physically, I will make him impure. But she reasons. She goes a little bit further than what she has seen. She has taken a risk beyond what she has experienced or even heard from others. And she says, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. It's pretty bold. She, she takes a risk that what she hasn't seen will happen. And so what happens? She touches Jesus' cloak. Jesus, it says in other, it says here too, Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, who has touched my clothes? And then, it's funny, because the, the, the other apostles, Jesus' apostles say, you see how the crowd is around you? They're all bumping into you. It's like you're on the, the, the subway in Rome, and, and like you're touching everybody. And you want to know who touched you? Come on, Jesus. The woman, of course, at first is a little taken aback, so she doesn't admit it immediately. And then finally, she, said, she realizes she was healed, and then she, she says what happened. Why is she afraid? She's afraid because Jesus is, she's afraid that Jesus is about to basically um, castigate her for having touched him. And he says, no, your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. See, Jesus as our Savior doesn't just forgive us our sins. He also is called, he also heals us. He offers us healing. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. And then, of course, you know, we get the bad news that comes for Jairus. And Jairus is like, oh no, my daughter's died. That's it, you know. Oh no, this woman stole the healing. Had, had, had he not been delayed, he would have been able to get to the house in time, right? And Jesus makes it quite clear. He says, do not be afraid, just have faith. I've never liked this translation. Because it makes faith sound like a noun that you have. I'm going to grab it. There's faith. Okay, I've got faith. That's it. No, Jesus doesn't say that in the Greek. He says, do not fear, only believe. That's a verb. It's a verb. It's an action. If I told somebody to run, and they hadn't really run before, they might run a little slowly. But with practice, they would run a lot more. Same thing with faith. When we believe, at first, we maybe only believe about this much. And then, as we see Jesus' power at work in our lives, slowly but surely, we begin to believe for even more. When we begin to see people healed, then we begin to believe in even greater miracles. It's just what happens. But if we haven't ever seen anybody healed, we might be like, "Eh, I don't know. I mean, I've thought that Jesus could heal, but I've never really imagined that. Here and now. In this place here. 
Let's, let's look at this. Let's look at what was happening. Jesus is walking through a crowd, and anybody who touches Jesus should be able to get healed. Why wasn't anybody else in the crowd healed? Why not? Not only, well, not only did they not ask, they didn't expect Jesus to heal them. They might have known Jesus heals people. Jesus is going to heal somebody. I just touched Jesus, but it doesn't compute. Like it did, they didn't put two and two together that if Jesus, you know, if Jesus can heal people, you touch him, you get healed. This woman with the hemorrhage puts it together and she expects. It's called expectant faith. In fact, it's pretty bold. And we see Jesus, Jesus lauds people who have that kind of expectant faith. This would have been, yeah, last year, around this time, I had heard the news from a woman who had come to our healing masses. She came twice. Well, she came more than twice, but she came twice specifically to a healing mass to be prayed with by the folks who were praying after the mass. And she was standing in. She wasn't asking for prayer for herself. She was standing in prayer for somebody else. And then I later found out that she only knew the person's grandmother. She didn't know the grandson. The woman, Jean, was her name. She wanted to pray for Peter, who had stage 4 bone cancer and leukemia. So the first time that she came to pray for us to pray with her at the, at the healing mass, we prayed. She came back the next month and reported that the bone cancer was gone. But he still had leukemia. It takes a lot of faith for somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to stand here and you pray for me and, and, I'll, and I'll receive it for, for this guy Peter. But she had love for the grandmother, again. So, <clears throat> the next month she comes, we're praying. Somebody in the prayer team just gets inspired by God. Just inspired, completely. Just immediately, Holy Spirit gives them the faith to say something completely and totally absurd. The person said, God, just give him new blood. Not even God please, or in the name of Jesus. No formula or anything like that. Just a complete and total faith statement. God, just give him new blood. She came back the next month and she said, it's all gone. So, very excited about that. It was actually Sunday, February 4th last year. I preached about Jesus healing people, because the gospel was how Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law, and how everybody in the town was, were bringing the sick to Jesus, right? They were bringing the sick to Jesus. So I said, look, this woman, Jean, did just what the people in the gospel were doing. They were bringing the sick to Jesus, knowing that they could receive healing for the sick people. And we've seen that in the scriptures, too, where Four men come carrying a guy in a stretcher, and seeing the the faith of the four men, he heals the guy who's paralytic. Not seeing the paralytic's faith, he saw the four people's faith and healed the paralytic. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say this again and again. You're going to hear me hammer at home again and again, because it's very important for us as Catholics. You see, the same guy who is healing people comes to us every day in the Eucharist. It's not a different Jesus. It's the same Jesus. The same one who was born of Mary and our humanity comes to us in a hidden way, still a very real way, in his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. But have we asked? Have we risked? Have we gone beyond what we've seen like the woman with the hemorrhage? Have we had to believe beyond what we'd seen, like Jairus? Because Jairus knew that Jesus could heal, but Jairus may not have known that Jesus could raise people from the dead. It's interesting. When Jesus gets to the house, he has to kick out anybody who doesn't believe. 
He has to kick out the people who have more faith in death than faith in him. It's very interesting to see that. Because they'll zap the atmosphere. He knows it. So the question that we want to see is this. We want to ask, what is our faith in? Who are we putting our faith in? In what we have seen or in Jesus? To finish the story. So I was preaching this at that Mass, talking about Jesus, who we have. And I admonished the people. I said, I encouraged them. I said, when you come up to, to, to receive communion, bring with you spiritually the people who are sick that you know who need healing. So, a couple weeks later, I get, I meet a, a woman, and uh, she says, you know, Father Chris, I have to tell you what happened. She said, you know, I had thought that God had already given my family a miracle because my nephew, who'd had a traumatic brain injury, was still alive. He didn't die from that injury. But he's, he was in the ICU and hadn't gotten up on his own yet. So when you said that to bring people to communion with us, I thought of him, and I realized it was not wrong to ask for more. It wasn't selfish to ask for more. So I received communion for him, and then I heard the next day that he sat up in bed for the first time on his own. And later he got up, took his first steps, and hugged his father for the first time since the accident. She said, when I heard that news, I was filled with joy because I knew, I knew deep within me it was the answer to the prayer that I had prayed at Mass. So, brothers and sisters, the reason for these stories isn't to glorify any of us, but it is to speak about the power of Jesus Christ present in our midst so that Jesus is glorified and so that our faith Our expectant faith, not our intellectual faith, our expectant faith is built up because we're about to touch Jesus. We are about to touch Jesus. Whew! We are about to touch Jesus at this Mass. So have faith.